So when I first started doing the slides for this talk, I waste a lot of time stuffing around with CSS because I'm a front end dev. And I put a little animation on this front slide and I realized nobody's ever seen it because when you start, it's done already. So here you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad someone's finally seen that. So me, uh, as Michelle said, my name is Erin Zimmer. Uh, contrary to what it says on the website, I don't work at Australia Post. I now work at Shine. And I'd like to thank them for letting me to come to this conference when I only started there last week. So <laughs> I think I've actually spent more time here than in the office. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter. And my slides are available on GitHub. Um, a word of warning about the slides. They are written in web components using HTML imports. So they're only going to work in a browser that supports HTML imports, or as we normally call that, Chrome. <laughs> um, what about all you folk? Who here writes JavaScript, or TypeScript, or Elm, or anything that gets run in a browser? Cool. Hopefully this talk will be interesting and relevant for you. For everyone else, um, there's pictures of dinosaurs. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I was pretty pleased, actually, on the way in from the airport. I saw in the, what is it, the concert, the concert hall? They've got dinosaur skeletons everywhere. That's, that's one of these ones. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so who's heard of the event loop? Cool. Uh, if you're anything like me, you've probably, but, but, like I was when I started this whole journey, you've probably, you know, you've heard of it, and you've got some idea that, it's got something to do with when you callbacks a run or something. Um, but you don't really know what's really going on. So by the end of this talk, we're going to have a really, a really crystal clear idea of what's going on. Or like, you know, like 1080p kind of level of clear. Um, to do that, let's start by having a look what's going on inside our browser. It turns out that inside the browser, there are a bunch of different bits. There's the bit that runs your JavaScript, obviously. There's a bit that handles network requests. There's a bit that um, handles timers. So when you call set timeout and set interval, uh, there's a bit that reads and writes to disk. You guys remember when disks look like this, right? <laughs> there's a bit that handles user input, so it tracks mouse position, uh, clicks, keyboard input, that kind of stuff. And there's a whole bunch of bits that deal with parsing and rendering uh, HTML and CSS, like managing the DOM and all that kind of stuff. So all of these bits that aren't the bit that runs your JavaScript, collectively they're called the web APIs. This bit that is the bit that runs your JavaScript is called the JavaScript engine. Or you might hear it referred to as a JavaScript VM. And there's a bunch of different JavaScript VMs kicking around. Uh, you might be familiar with V8, which runs Chrome and Node and Opera, if anybody's still using that. <laughs> uh, Edge has an engine called Chakra. Uh, WebKit browsers like Safari use Squirrelfish. And Firefox has an engine called uh, Squirrel Monkey. I could not find a logo for that, though, so here is an actual Squirrel Monkey. <laughs> <laughs> so the event loop is basically responsible for orchestration between these web APIs and the JavaScript engine. And in its simplest form, it looks something like this. So it's an infinite loop. It's going to run forever. Uh, each iteration of the loop, it's going to take a task off the task queue, and it's going to run that task. Uh, so while this code is uh, nice and succinct, I guess, it probably raises a couple of questions. Like, what's a task? What's a task queue? And how do tasks get on the task queue? These are all fair questions. Um, and we'll start with the first one. A task is basically just a bit of JavaScript that's run in a particular context. So if we have a script tag like this, the parser is going to read through, it's going to parse the JavaScript there, and it's going to create a task. And that task is then going to get added to the task queue, and the event loop is going to run through it. So there's a couple of important things here. First of all, tasks always run through to completion. Once a task starts running, it either runs the whole way through and finishes, or you've fucked up and it exits with an exception. 
but there's no, uh, there's no concept of an interrupt in JavaScript. Everything runs through start to finish. Also, the task queue, as the name suggests, is a queue. So things get executed in the order that they arrive, first in, first out. Um, so, I mean, this is all pretty easy to understand, I guess, but it kind of seems like a bit of a, a roundabout kind of way to execute a bit of code, right? Sort of wonder, like, JavaScript, what? Why? Why are you like that? And the answer has two parts. The first one is something that most people, I think, who write JavaScript know. And that is, JavaScript is single-threaded. If you're writing JavaScript, you don't have to worry about all that crap with concurrency and locking and whatever. I don't know what any of that stuff. I don't know how it works. Um, you don't have to worry about it, which is nice. But it's also important, because every bit of JavaScript that's running in the browser, at some point, it's going to interact with the DOM, right? Otherwise, what, what would be the point? And the DOM is essentially this massive data structure that is shared not only between all of the JavaScript running on your page, but also potentially JavaScript running on other pages, which I'll show you later. So it's really important that we have a mechanism to lock this, I guess, so you don't have multiple um, bits of JavaScript accessing it at the same time. So yeah, JavaScript is single-threaded. Browsers, however, have a shitload of threads. If you remember our diagram from before with all of these things, these guys, they're all running in their own threads. This is, this is how asynchronous programming can even work in JavaScript, right? If they, these all need to be able to run at different threads so they can run at the same time, Otherwise, you'd have to sit there blocking every time you write, made a network request. So what does that look like? So say I wanted to call one of these web APIs. I'm going to call set timeout, um, and I'm going to pass it a callback and ask for a delay of three seconds. So what's going to happen in the browser? The engine's going to say, hey, web APIs, could you wait three seconds and then run this callback for me? And the web API is going to say, no worries. You keep doing what you're doing and I'll take care of this thing. So here we have our browser, our engine is gonna keep doing its thing on the, okay. When you're talking like this, I always get mixed up. The little clock guy, is that on the left or the right? <laughs> okay, because <laughs> it's on my left and I don't know, all right, let's, let's call that the right. All right, so we've got the JavaScript running on the left, uh, the, the JavaScript engine running on the left and the timeout running on the right. And they're gonna run both at the same time. JavaScript engine is going to keep doing what it's doing. Time is going to run until the three seconds runs out. At that point, the, time, the, the web API is going to say, hey, JavaScript engine, I've waited three seconds. Now I need you to run that callback that you wanted to run. And the JavaScript engine is going to say, piss off. I'm busy right now. But that's OK, because we can just add it to the queue. The engine can finish what it was doing before, and then it can run our callback. And everything works fine. Um, so in a, the grander scheme, for instance, we could have a web page running. Uh, it's maybe parsing some script tags. The user is interacting with it, because they always do that. Um, we've got some timers running. We made some network requests. And all of these things can be happening in parallel while the JavaScript engine is just running one thing at a time, single-threaded. So the event loop essentially provides like a funnel between the multi-threaded um, nature of the browser into the single-threaded nature of the engine. So that's the event loop. Uh, super easy, right? Yeah? Cool. Because it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. You see, the task queue runs in conjunction with the rendering pipeline. And the rendering pipeline is responsible for everything that you see displayed on the screen. right? So every time you update the DOM, you change your CSS, anything that needs to be laid out again, that's what the rendering pipeline does. And the way that it works is so we've got our web APIs across the top again. We've got the rendering pipeline on the right and the task queue on the left. And the rule is that any time the event loop finishes processing a task, then it can run the rendering pipeline. It doesn't always run the rendering pipeline, though, because um, browsers are clever. And they, they don't like doing extra work. 
And the rendering pipeline knows that there's no point in calculating all of that layout on the screen, because these are expensive calculations. It knows there's no point doing all that work unless the screen is about to refresh, right? So most screens are running at 60 hertz. Um, so it's going to run every 16 milliseconds. So if we run a task, uh, this is slowed down in case that wasn't obvious. <laughs> the task finishes, and after the 16 milliseconds have finished, then the rendering pipeline will run. Obviously, sitting around doing nothing like that for all that time is a bit of a waste. So in the real world, oh, hang on, it's ready to render again. In the real world, the browser is going to run a couple of tasks. Um, so the running pipeline is not ready to run. It'll run another task. Remember earlier I said, though, that tasks can't be interrupted? So if the, um, if the engine is partway through a task, when it gets to the, 15, or the 16 milliseconds, then it has to finish that task. The rendering pipeline has to wait. Now, if, I mean, if you lose a couple of milliseconds here and there, it's not really going to matter. That's fine. But if you have a lot of tasks that run really long or a really long time over, like, or one that runs a really long time over 16 milliseconds, the browser's going to start dropping frames <laughs> and your page is going to run really janky. <laughs> <laughs> So there are ways to deal with this. And one way is if you've got a long-running task, break it up into smaller tasks. So here we've got a function that you pass in a callback, and it's going to run it multiple times. That could be a big number. So rather than running you know, one thing 10,000 times, which is going to take a long time, it's just going to run it once. And then it's going to create a new task and pass in back into itself recursively. So you'll still get a loop that runs through you know, 10,000 times, but each iteration is going to be in its own task, which means that the rendering pipeline will have an opportunity to, to repaint the screen after each iteration. Um, I mean, this is one way to do it. It works OK in this particular use case. Um, if the action itself took a long time, it would still like, make the page janky. So it's not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is to use web workers. So to uh, create a web worker, we can create a script, which is listening for an on-message event. Oh, see, events everywhere. Um, which is just doing the same thing as our loop before, right? Except it's just in a for loop. It's going to run through and call that action however many times are in the, the repeats. In our main um, application code, we just create a, a worker and pass it that script, and then we pass it a message. Um, and that will work without breaking any rendering. Yay. So why don't web workers interfere with rendering? The answer to that is in the spec. It's, uh, it's really straightforward, very simple. Uh, each worker global scope object has a distinct event loop separate from those used by units of related similar origin browsing contexts. Right? You, you all got that? It's just saying each web worker has its own event loop. So this looks something like this. We've got our uh, main browser window on the right and the web worker on the, the web worker on the left, and you can see our browser can do all of its stuff, create some events. It can send a message to the web worker, which might make some network requests, might create some timeouts, whatever. Can send a message back. You can see those two things are operating completely independently of each other, so they can't interfere with each other. Um, they're essentially running in two separate threads. <laughs> Um, they are completely isolated. The web worker doesn't have access to any data structure that's touched by the main browser. So they don't share a DOM. Um, they don't even share, when you post messages between them, all of that is, po is passed by copies of the data, so they can't interact with each other any other way. Uh, the web worker event loop looks just like the main event loop, except a bit simpler. Um, it doesn't have to deal with any user interactions. It doesn't have a rendering pipeline, obviously, because it doesn't have a DOM. And it's not allowed to touch the DOM at all. So party. Um, if you're wondering if you can use web workers in your particular application, the answer is a pretty resounding yes. Like, unless you're supporting IE9 or some old version of Android browser, then yeah, you can use web workers. 
Um, the one red one on the line that is the, the current browsers is Opera Mini. If you've got something that needs a web worker, it is not going to run in Opera Mini anyway, so you've got other problems to deal with. Cool. So, web workers run in separate threads. They're not the only reason that a browser might run JavaScript in multiple threads, though. If you've ever had a bunch of tabs open in Chrome and you've opened the task manager or the activity monitor on a Mac, you will see something like this. This is because Chrome opens every single uh, tab. Oh, I just saw the other knitter down there. <laughs> <laughs> Chrome runs every single tab in its own process. <laughs> so every tab has its own event loop, which means that there's no data sharing between them. Also means that different tabs can't um, impact the performance of other tabs. Everything's nice and sandboxed and separated out into separate threads. Um, Chrome does this, but uh, browsers don't have to work this way. right? So Firefox uses a different model. If you were to open all of these same tabs in Firefox, you would get this. That's one process for the browser itself one process for your extensions, and up to four processes for your tabs. So if you've got more than four tabs open, some of those tabs are sharing a process, and they're sharing an event loop. So they could potentially affect each other performance-wise. Um, obviously, this has some dra drawbacks due to that, but the big advantage is that it means that you have some RAM left over to do other things. So. Uh, yeah, like I said, it's up to, up to the browsers whether they prefer to use this sort of sharing model or if they prefer to keep everything tightly um, locked away. I don't know what this is a photo of. I, it's <laughs> um, yeah, so there's one exception to that, and that is uh, shared browsing contexts. So if you've got a page that has an iframe or that opens a child window, those two things have to be on the same, on the same event loop because they share some stuff. So for instance, here we have a link that is going to open a child window, like so. I'll just make this a bit smaller. And put it over here so we can see both of them. So this button, when I click it, it basically runs a while loop for like five seconds. So it's holding up the rendering pipeline. Um, just wait for the dinosaur to come back. So if I click on this, come back dinosaur. You can see that this page is stuck because it can't re-render, but also our dinosaur is stuck because it can't re-render either because these two things share an event loop, even though they're separate tabs and we're in Chrome. Um, there is a reason for that, though. Like I said, they share some data structures, so they have access to each other's DOM. So I can do, uh, no, not document, render dot. Does anybody have a favorite um, CSS color? Rebecca, Rebecca Purple? All right. So I can control the color of the background of that parent window from the child window. Uh, the reason the dinosaur is still in a black background is because it's actually in an iframe. But that is not a problem. Typing. You don't need that body. All right, do you want Rebecca purple again or do we have another color? Purple it is. Ah, oh, no. Forgot style. Ah, a dot. All right, so we can control both of those from the child window. Um, this looks like a security problem, it's not because these things have to be on the same origin, and presumably you're not going to try and hack yourself. Um, previously, there was a bit of a security risk here, because uh, even a cross-origin child window could actually control the navigator option, op, bleh, object of the parent window, which meant you could open a child window, it could go back and change the page that the parent window was on. Um, but somebody noticed, and I think all of the major browsers have patched that vulnerability. 
That said, if you do open a child window, even on a different domain, it is going to be still running in the same event loop as your window. So there is still the, the risk of having the performance issues, like I showed you there, where a slow script in the child window can um, slow down the parent window. Luckily, there is a fix. Um, should we keep the slides purple or? <laughs> ah. <laughs> I think there might be some contrast issues later on. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we can fix this just by adding this rel equals no opener attribute anytime we're opening a child window. So we do that now. Um, we can see that if I run this again, this window is stop stopped, but the dinosaur still keeps running. And I no longer have access to that parent um, window. Window.opener is now null. So we've solved that problem. So now our event loop looks like this. It's still an infinite loop. Every iteration, we're going to grab a task off the task queue, and we're going to run that task. And then if it's time to repaint, we'll repaint. Are we all cool with this? Cool, because it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than this. If you were to uh, sit down and read through the spec, which I, I mean, that's how I spend my weekends. I don't know about, about all of you. But you would learn that an event loop can have one or more task queues. Uh, so at this point, I kind of have to level with you. I, I was writing my slides, and I thought what I'll do is I'll show you how an event loop has multiple task queues. I'll go and I'll have a look at like an open source browser, and I'll see how it implements the event loop, and I'll, um, I'll see how many task queues it's got, and I'll be able to show you a real proper demo. But I'm a, I'm a JavaScript developer, and <laughs> browsers, by and large, are written in C++. C++, it turns out, is mostly punctuation and the word delegate. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> Instead, we're going to look at a theoretical browser with multiple event, uh, event no, multiple task queues. Uh, to be fair, this example is actually the example that's given in the spec, so I didn't just make it up. Somebody else just made it up. So this browser has two task queues, and it prioritizes user input. So how that works is if we have user input, it goes in the user input queue. If we have anything else, it goes in the everything else queue. And each, so each turn of the event loop now, the browser has to pick a queue to choose from. And in this particular case, it's going to choose user input. If there's user input in the queue, it's going to run that. Once that user input queue is empty, then it'll go back to processing the other queue. Um, everything else stays the same, right? The task still runs start to finish. You can still run the rendering pipeline after each um, task finishes. All of that's still the same. Um, I mean, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. There's a, there's a couple of rules. So the first one is that the queues can be executed in any order, which isn't really a rule. It's kind of like the opposite of a rule, but that's it's up to the browsers. So we could have said, pick. Three, queue, three tasks of one queue, four tasks of the other, whatever. It's up to the browser. Um, the queues are still queues, so the tasks have to be executed in the order that they arrive. And tasks from the same source have to go in the same queue. So if you have a queue that has all of your timer tasks, all of your timer tasks have to go in there. Um, to be honest, this isn't going to affect your life at all. I don't, it's just in there for completeness, I guess. I wanted you to get used to the idea of multiple queues. So this is how our event loop looks now. It's still an infinite loop. At each iteration, we're going to pick a queue. And then we're going to take the first task off that queue. We're going to run that task. And then if it's time to repaint, we'll repaint. Are we all cool with that? Awesome, because it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. We also have microtask queues. So microtasks are, are tasks that can happen between tasks. Uh, there's a couple of different ways you can get them. So has anybody here used mutation observers? Nobody. OK. Oh, one, one person. So a mutation observer is a thing that you can do where you watch an element in the DOM, and when it changes, your callback gets fired. So if it gets resized, it gets things added to it, whatever. Your callback gets fired. Um, and that callback is executed as a microtask. The more 
common use for microtasks is promises. If you create a promise, when you call the then callback or the catch callback, those things are microtasks. Thirdly, you can create a microtask by calling window.qmicrotask and passing it a callback. Window.qmicrotask is currently implemented in approximately zero browsers. So if you're going to do that, you might have to do it sometime in the future. Okay, so how does it actually work? So say we've got, um, we've got our microtask queue there in yellow next to the, um, next to the rendering pipeline. So we're going to run some tasks, we're going to do some stuff, and we're going to have a promise. And the promise callback is going to go in the microtask queue. And the microtask queue is going to get run every time a task finishes. So we finish the task, we run, run the microtask queue. If there's a few things in the microtask queue, we're going to run all of those things. If we add more things to the microtask queue while it's running, we're going to run those things too. And you'll notice, the microtask queue takes priority over the rendering pipeline. The rendering pipeline can't run until everything in the microtask queue has run. So we can have a look at a quick demo of like, the implications of that, I guess. So tasks versus microtasks. Let's start with tasks. So real simple bit of code. We're going to click the button. It's going to call this start function, which is going to find an element on the page. And it's going to set the inner HTML of that element to the number of tasks that have run and then it's going to increment the number of tasks. Then it's create a new task by calling set timeout, which just recursively calls itself. So it's essentially an infinite loop made of tasks. So if we click the button, it starts counting. It's, it's pretty boring, but <coughs> you can see, even though this is an infinite loop, because they're tasks, the rendering pipeline gets a chance to run. So I can still interact with the page. I can highlight text. I can click stop. We can all move on with our lives. If we do the same thing with microtasks, almost like I know something bad is going to happen. <laughs> so it's the same thing. We're going to click the button. It's going to call our function. We're going to find the element on the page. We're going to set the inner HTML to the number of microtasks that have run and increment our counter. And then we're going to create a new microtask using promise.resolve.then. So if I click the button, you can immediately see everything has gone to shit. <laughs> the button has rendered the click, but it hasn't popped back up again. I don't know if you can see the cursor there, but it's still the little hand that you get when you hover over a button. I can't um, select any of the text. And I can't click the stop button, which wouldn't have helped anyway because I never implemented it. <laughs> um, if we leave this for a bit longer, Chrome will notice that it's broken and it will um, let us stop the process, but we don't have that kind of time. OK, so what's going on there? We've run our script, we've clicked on the button, and that callback has created a microtask, which has created a microtask, which has created a microtask, and so on. So as you can see, because we keep creating microtasks, the rendering pipeline never gets a chance to run, so we just get stuck with nothing being able to happen on the browser. Um, so the moral of the story here is don't create infinite loops out of microtasks but also be aware that they can um, affect when your rendering pipeline runs, if you're doing a lot of stuff in microtasks. Cool. So now our event loop looks like this. It's still an infinite loop. Each iteration, we're going to pick a queue, and then we're going to grab the first task off the queue, and then we're going to run that task. Then as long as there are tasks in the microtask queue, we're going to run all of those. And then if it's time to repaint, We'll repaint. Are we all cool with that? Cool, because it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. <laughs> we also have the animation frame callback queue, which is another special queue. You can add things to the animation queue by calling request animation frame and passing in a callback. I guess the question here is why? Why would you do such a thing? So imagine we have an animation of a square. It's pretty exciting. I probably should have used a dinosaur. Um, this square is moving along sine wave, so its position at any point in time is just dependent on how much time has passed. We can animate that. It's pretty straightforward. So if we were to write the code for that, our first naive attempt might look something like this. So we've got a while loop that's going to keep running until the right-hand side of the box 
or the left-hand side, or whichever side we decided that was, was is going to hit the right-hand side of the screen. And in each iteration of the loop, we're going to calculate how much time has passed, and then we're going to set the x and y coordinates of the box. If we do this, we will get this. Uh, the, the box is just going to appear in its final position without any animation, and we're going to be sad. The reason this has happened is that what we've done is essentially this. We've created a massive task that's running through a while loop, calculating all the positions, recalculating, recalculating, all the way through the while loop, but it's all in one task, so the rendering pipeline can't run. So it doesn't run until we've finished all of the calculations, by which point the box is already at the edge. So we can try it again with tasks. This time, we calculate the distance, uh, we calculate how much time has passed, we calculate the position of the box, and then if the box hasn't got to the end of the screen yet, we create a new task using set timeout, which then calls the same uh, function again, uh, recursively. Right? So this works, spoiler alert, it works, um, because it looks something like this. We're going to create a task, and then do the calculations, create another task, do the calculations, create another task, and the rendering pipeline is going to get a chance to run. Hooray, so our box is going to move. And then we're going to keep going like that. We can keep creating tasks, keep doing the calculations, and every 16 milliseconds the rendering pipeline can run, and our box can move along and we get the nice animation. Um, you can probably see the drawback of this method, which is that like four out of five tasks get thrown out, right? We do the calculation and then we don't use it. We just do another calculation, we don't use it, and then we do another calculation until finally we do a calculation and the rendering pipeline runs. So this is, this is pretty wasteful. And the way that we can solve that is by using a request animation frame. So, the reason request animation frame works to solve this problem is we have our script running, we call request animation frame, the callback gets added to the, request, to the animation frame queue there in the green next to the rendering pipeline, but that queue only gets run when the rendering pipeline is about to run. So we've got tasks here, we create this guy, that task is gonna sit there until the rendering pipeline is ready to run rendering pipeline is ready to run. And then the animation frame tasks will get run. If there are multiple animation frame tasks in the queue, they'll all get run. But if you add more while you're processing the queue, those new ones aren't going to get run. And the reason for that is that we're probably using it like we were in our example, where we're calling request animation frame, and within the callback for that, we're setting up the next frame. So obviously we want to repaint between each frame. Cool. So now we've got the top box animated using request animation frame and the bottom box animated using set timeout. And as you can see, they're, like, it's pretty identical. They work pretty much the same. With the one important difference that by the time they get to the edge of the screen, request animation frame has done 700 odd calculations and set timeout has done 2,600. So like three and a half times as many. Um, uh, the other thing is that this only works exactly the same because there's nothing else happening on this page. If there was a bunch of other stuff going on, the set timeout task could get added to the end of a long queue. So it might not get run every time there's a frame. So not only are you wasting calculations, it's not even doing anything. So yeah, request animation frame. Again, if you're wondering if you can use a request animation frame in your particular application, the answer is yes, unless you're using Opera Mini, in which case, again, you've got bigger problems. And now our event loop looks like this. It's an infinite loop. Every iteration, we're going to pick a queue. We're going to take the first task off that queue. We're going to execute the task. We're going to run everything in the micro task queue. Then, if it's time to repaint, we're going to run everything that's currently in the animation frame queue, and then we're going to repaint. Cool, are we all okay with that? I promise that's as complicated as it gets. <laughs> there is just one other small thing that we haven't spoken about, and that is Node. So who here writes Node code? 
cool, quite a few people, nice. But this is the bit you'll be interested in. Uh, good news, no, the node event loop works quite a lot like the browser event loop, except it's a bit simpler. Um, it has a set of APIs, much like the web APIs. They're not called web APIs though, because that would be weird. They're called the Unicorn Velociraptor Library, or LibUV. When I found out that that's what LibUV stands for, I didn't even believe it, but apparently that's a thing. <laughs> the node event loop, like I said, it's a bit simpler. Uh, there's no DOM, so that's a whole bunch of worries that you don't even have to care about. Obviously, there's no rendering pipeline. You're pretty limited in user interactions, so you can, like, you can get a, a user typing into a terminal or whatever, but they're not free to just click on shit whenever they feel like, like they always do. And there's none of that worry about sharing uh, an event loop between various windows because there aren't any. The other difference is that the browser event loop keeps running forever in an infinite loop, round and round and round. The node event loop doesn't really work like that. It, um, it'll run through, if there's tasks, it'll run through a loop. If there's more tasks waiting, it'll run through another loop. But once all the tasks are done, the process will exit. So it looks like this. Uh, we've got three queues that are worth talking about. Uh, they are the event callback queue, the check queue, and the timer queue. So if we do stuff like make um, disk reads, network requests, that kind of thing, they're gonna go in the event queue. Uh, the check queue I will get to in a minute. And if we call set timeout or set interval, it's gonna go in the timer queue. Um, Node queues are referred to as phases because of the way it runs. Basically, it's gonna start with the event phase, it's gonna run everything that's in the event queue, and then it's gonna to move to the check phase and run everything that's in the check queue, and then it's gonna to move to the timer phase and run everything that's in that, that timer queue. So it just runs everything, everything, everything through phases. And then it goes back to the start again. Uh, the check queue. You can add things to the check queue by calling set immediate and passing it a callback. It basically just works the same as set timeout with no delay. Uh, the difference being that if you call set timeout with no delay and you also call set immediate, set immediate will get called first because of the order that the queues are in. Um, yeah, node also has two microtask queues. No, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> one of them is for promises. It just works exactly the same as the browser one. The other microtask queue is the next tick queue. You can add things to the next tick queue by calling process.nextTick and passing it a callback. Um, it's sort of intended as a way to let you, um, if something fails, you can finish the process running and then do the error handling later, in a, like in a microtask, so it's not spread out over another task. But yeah, that's the thing. Um, yeah, so we have events, timers, whatever going on. Um, as soon as a task is finished um, being processed, then we'll do the microtasks. The next tick queue is processed first, and then the promise queue. Um, yeah, I mean, it, like I said, it's it's pretty similar to the browser. It's pretty straightforward. There's just that there's two new things of uh, set immediate and process dot next tick. If you have trouble remembering them, it's pretty simple. Set immediate does something on the next tick. Process dot next tick does something immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Naming things is hard, I guess. <laughs> So, the node event loop is a not infinite loop. It's just gonna keep looping as long as there are tasks waiting to be processed. Each iteration, we're gonna pick a queue. And then as long as there are tasks in that queue, we're gonna pick the first task off the queue, and we're gonna run that task. Then we're gonna run everything that's in the next tick queue, and then we're gonna run everything that's in the promise queue. So, easy. Cool, so that is the event loop. Things to remember. Don't block rendering, it will make things, it will make users sad. Um, if you have long running tasks, you can use web workers to solve that problem. If you're opening child windows, use rel equals no opener. It is um, a good practice to use even when it doesn't matter. Um, Microtasks beat tasks, so they're always gonna execute first and they can affect the way that things render. And use request animation frame if you are making animations. So hopefully, by the end of this talk now, if you're looking through some JavaScript code, and you see something like this, and you think, what were they doing? 
you understand now why they might have, why the, the previous developer, who might have been you, did this, why it works, and perhaps what you can do to not do it. But most of all, I hope that now you all feel like clever girls. 